Welcome, brothers and sisters, to Mormon Movie Reviews, where LDS movie lovers belong under humble host days, and I'm here with Mormonish podcasting legend, Rebecca. How's it going, Rebecca? I'm great tonight. I'm so excited for this. This is one of my all-time favorite videos when I was growing up, honestly. Wonderful. Well, it is April 20th, 2023. This is episode 87. Where, where, what are we reviewing today, Rebecca? Oh, how near to the angels. Oh, my goodness. You bet. Released in 1956. This has a running time of 41 minutes. It's not rated and it's a religious drama. Now, it works best if you've seen this film before, um, though that's not required and a spoiler alert. Now, we're going to watch this uh, short together while we make some insightful and occasionally a reverent commentary. Um, can you give us a synopsis, Rebecca? I will. This uh, video, like I said, was one of my favorites growing up. I almost based my entire dating experience on this, a young woman named Janet on her wedding day in her wedding dress reflects back on how close she came to perhaps not having the outcome that she and everyone who loves her wanted for her. She, in retrospect, goes through her different dating experiences, the different boys she knew, and the different circumstances that she found herself in and how she finally successfully arrived at a temple marriage at the end. Yes, this is an official church video brought to us by the Young Women's Mutual Improvement Association, which was founded way back by Brigham Young under a different name back in uh, 1869, the Retrenchment Society. Remember that? The Retrenchment Society, I do. Now, we are lucky to have this film in color because, um, you know, a lot of church films in this era were only shot in black and white. Remember, this is 1956, so it's very, um, we're very, very lucky here. This was produced by Judge Whitaker, the most prolific LDS filmmaker of all time. So here we go. If I were you, Alice, I'd put those buttons about a half inch in. Now, this is our first look at Mary Anderson on the right, who plays the part of Janet. Miss Anderson has not played in any other church films that I can find. Keep working on the hem, and I'll sew on the button. You know, Janet, there isn't a bride in that entire magazine can hold a candle to you. <laughs> you know, we're starting early with the Mormon wi uh, women physically comparing themselves to others, aren't we? Yeah, that's exactly what you do, especially in your wedding dress. Got to okay. do that. Yeah, I guess we have a uh, Johnny Lingo, uh, maybe an earlier Johnny Lingo on our hands here. <laughs> of course, Aunt Rose. Those brides didn't have you for a seamstress. Oh, you and your flattery. It's little wonder that you captured such a prize. Oh, dear, I'm out of thread. Oh. Why don't you slip out of this while I run and get the thread? Hey, slip out of this. Lock your hearts and buckle your seatbelts, folks. This could be getting kind of good. What's the rating on this again? We need to double check, right? Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, luckily, it's not rated. I think we're. I think we're going to be fine. We're going to be. This isn't Netflix, so we're fine. Yeah. Oh, you really think you'll like it, Mother? Oh uh, yeah, you're way prettier than his thirteen other wives. Oh, sorry. Um, wrong era. Okay, I'm thinking earlier. Wrong era. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, that's that wrong era. Okay, I got it. I doubt if you'll even notice it. Mother. Mom, how did such a wonderful fellow ever fall in love with me? That's a good question. I, you know, I think his patriarchal blessing said that he was going to marry a uber pale Mormon hottie, though. I read that in his... <laughs> So I think a lot of blessings say that. Yeah, yeah some just... of them are duplicates, as we know. Oh, yeah, that's true. Men have been falling in love with you since you were three. Whoa, wait a minute. Is Alice talking about Joseph Smith? <laughs> Too soon? Since she was three? I mean, Joseph Smith, he only started on him when they were like 13, 14. I mean, he didn't even go three. That's, wow. That we is... know of. That we know of. Okay, okay. But choosing the right man is the most important thing that a woman ever does, isn't it? Yes. And choosing one that's worthy to take you to the temple. Alice? Where did you hide the thread? Oh. What did I do with it? I I'll come down. We will go down. Oh, sorry. Oh, darling. How proud I am of you. So clean and strong. Mother's happy you are worthy. But what about me? She'll never know how close I came to being denied the greatest of all blessings. The greatest of all blessings. Is that a young women's medallion? I think it probably is. I think she's wearing one if we look closely. <laughs> I shall always be thankful to my Heavenly Father for those wonderful people who pointed the way for me. For without them, darling, I'd never have had you. Yeah, I am just dying to see a picture of this handsome white Mormon stud muffin, hopefully without a shirt on. 
I don't know if we're going to get that. I mean, uh, this was the 1950s. I think everything's a little more top drawer than that. Ah, uh, well, you can always hope. That's right. Maybe a V-neck, something like that. Seems only yesterday that I was a beehive girl. And even then, popularity was almost an obsession with me. Being one of the crowd was the most important thing in the world. And it didn't particularly matter if it was the right crowd or the wrong one. Hey, it's 1956. She's wearing pants, Rebecca. I know. She's a liberal gal. I can tell that. And she just told us that she wasn't even concerned about running with the wrong crowd. So I think it starts here with pants. Wow. She just, she's a real uh, trendsetter. She's really bucking the... Uh, it could be a danger, though. It could be, uh, could be a right. sign of danger, actually. I'm thinking it is. I remember Betty Fraser and Babs Pearson, two of the most popular girls in junior high. Well, I know I missed it last Tuesday, Babs. But gee whiz, kid, if I keep doing this, someone's sure to tell my folks. <laughs> I know, but you know how old-fashioned my mother is about these things. Oh, she'd simply have a fit if she knew I were ditching mutual. Okay, ditching mutual. What's mutual again, Rebecca? Oh, my goodness, this will date me. But currently, it's called Young Men, Young Women. But back right. in my day, it was called Mutual. and The Mutual Improvement Association. But you would call it Mutual. Are you going to Mutual tonight? Yep. Which is basically right on that. in the middle of the week, young men, young women mm -hmm. would go to basically a Sunday school and activity sort of situation, right? Yep. Midweek, okay. every week. Absolutely. You did? A real cool jazz number? Oh, crazy. <laughs> Neat. Oh, I'll simply die if I don't hear it, Bab. Listen, I'll tell you what. I'll meet you at 730, Okay. But, Baz, we've got to be home by 9.30 or my folks will really lay down the law. Now, so we have the dual evils of uh, skipping mutual and listening to jazz music. That's Remember, we're in 1956. Jazz music, we think that's good music. Nowadays, that's good for kids to listen to. Back then, that's evil. So skipping mutual, listening to jazz. What's next? She's going to get high on crystal meth? Well, and listen to her language. Neat, kid, Babs, crazy. I mean, Ooh. she's already profaning. Yeah, she's pushing the envelope. She's wearing pants. Boy, this, oh, wow. This this could be uh, a bad ending here. I'm, I'm, I'm very worried about it. Okay, bye. Yeah, yeah, we're listening to Jasmine. Whoa, we're dancing. We're really pushing the envelope here, Rebecca. Look at that. Yeah, boy, you, they should be at Mutual. Oh. Man, I gotta take five. Boy, am I big. <sighs> Oh, thank you. Oh, Bab, I'm really thirsty. You got any pop or anything in the house? Are you kidding? It's impossible to choose anything around here with my kid brother. He drinks up everything. Well, let's go down to the service station and get some from the machine then. Oh, swell. Me idea. Let's go. Come on. Well, what do we have tonight, kids? I want a lemon lime. Let's see. I'll take an orange. Okay, orange it is. Hey, look, two for the price of one. Oh, it must be broken. Let me, let me. Oh, my God. Too bad. Only three for one dime. Directions. Insert coin, then slide bottle along dotted line. Oh, we get our speed. Here, Jeff. Well, thanks. I think I'd rather pay for mine. Not me. I get a kick out of outsmarting these dumb clucks. Okay, so what are we learning about uh, Janet's friends here, Rebecca? Oh, they're willing to push the envelope. Uh, they are living on the edge. They got a free soda, and they didn't pay for it or let anyone know what had happened. They're just walking away with the merchandise. Yeah, and Janet, she doesn't look too happy about the situation. By the way, notice that uh, Babs, uh, um, the Janet's friends, they're in, like, jailbird striped attire. You know what I mean? These <laughs> girls are a real bad influence on our protagonist. Okay, so notice first it all starts with skipping mutual. Next thing you know, you're 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 listening to jazz music. Then you're losing using a lot of uh, lingo, uh, you know, uh, edgy edgy language. Now we're petty theft. Now we're smoking. Then lung cancer. I mean, it's all a downward. It's all going downhill. Within like five minutes or or less. That's the, it's incredible. Yeah, small one small step just right to outer darkness. Oh, how do they find out? I said, my dude, I 
just wants to come back to that. Hey, girl. 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 Okay, let's have them. Have what? My cigarette. It's against the law for minors to have them in the first place. The second place you stole them. I think I'll just call them. Oh, no, wait a minute. Here. There, that's more like it. Say, aren't you Will Howard's little girl? No, no. I mean, no. I'll bet he doesn't know what you're up to. I have to know what you're just calling. Oh, please don't call him. I didn't mean to do anything. Listen, you kids, get on home where you belong. Don't let me catch you around here again. Time for a state disciplinary council. Maybe not quite yet, but they're definitely on the road. Sure are. Oh, what'd you let him scare you for? He wouldn't have done anything. Oh, forget it. Hey, murder in the darkness on at 8.30. Let's go. Well, if you kids don't mind, neutral's just about out, and I think I'll go on over and walk home with the kids. Okay. Go on, Jan. Bye. We'll see you later, Jan. Notice these two uh, young women here. Notice the shoulders here. What are, you, what are you seeing here? I am noticing that, that there really is no problem at church wearing what would now be called a porn shoulder, meaning that, a, you know, the shoulder and below is exposed. You would not see that in the 80s or the 90s or even going forward. But in the 50s, if you look at beauty queens displayed in pictures at BYU, they all have, you know, they're all showing shoulder. They look very glamorous. So, yeah, that's definitely a trend that started a little later. Right. as uh, You brought that up. I literally, yes, <laughs> that's contestants. If you think about the B, uh, Miss BYU pageants here in the 19, it was, these are 1982. You still see the shoulders without the shoulder caps on there. And again, here, this is 1981. Again, no shoulder caps here. It wasn't Really, and again, here, 1982, still no shoulders. It wasn't until the mid 80s until the so called porn shoulder thing really started to take off. And so, this is a very period appropriate for these uh, girls to um, be wearing the outfits that they are, right? Yep. She says that she's going to call your mother. My mother? What for? I've got to talk to her. She's still inside. Hi, Janet. Oh, Sister Stanley. Helen said you're going to call my mother. What you want to talk to her about? Oh, I was going to call your mother to see if you'd like to go to the canyon with us Friday and Saturday. Oh, I'd love to go with you. And I'm awfully glad I got to talk to you before. Well, I mean about it. That was the most perfect trip. It was the first time I'd ever been in the mountains with girls my own age. Then, too, it was there that I really became acquainted with Roberta Stanley. That first morning, Roberta and I awoke before the others, and she took me on sort of a nature ramble. She was wonderful. She was a big sister as well as a teacher. She could cook and swim, but, but most of all, she taught me to understand beauty and to feel real joy. Now, notice the sister Stanley. Her skills are in cooking, swimming, beauty, teaching. These are acceptable women's endeavors as opposed to leading, working, presiding, and governing. Those are left to men, right? That's absolutely correct. And uh, where are we here, by the way? It looks to me like Aspen Grove. I'm right. familiar with that. BYU does own that. Messenger of nature, which I know will always remain with me. She'll never know how much her talk around the campfire that night meant to me. She talked about the old-fashioned virtues of honesty and chastity in, in such a straightforward, personal way that the lesson really sank in. So many of the things she stood for became a part of me. There sure are a lot of white and delight some uh, young folks at this uh, outing, aren't there? Well, it's Utah Aspen Grove. What else would you expect? <laughs> My newfound enthusiasm for Mutual, which had started in the Beehive program, carried over into the Maya Maids. Okay, Maya Maids, uh, Rebecca, what are, she's talking about Beehive and Maya Maids. What, what is that? Yeah, she's talking about her progression through the Young Women's Program. When you start back then at age 12, you're a beehive for two years, and then you become a Maya maid um, for the next two years. So you're 15, 16, and then, of course, you end up being a laurel, and then you graduate into, you know, Relief Society because then you're married, of course. <laughs> so that's kind of the progression. So the, we can date Janet now. Now she went through the beehive, so she's a Maya maid. So about how old is Janet now? So she'd be 14, 15. 
right, 14 to 15. Of course, the church uh, disbanded those uh, no, those uh, monikers for the Beehive Laurel Mine Maze. They, they disbanded that back in, um, what was that, 2019. And uh, Rebecca, what did they replace it with? And, and that's what I was just trying to rack my brain for. I do not even know what to call. Do they call them by their ages? I'm not even sure. They didn't replace it with anything. So the new classes are simply See? young women. So, yeah, they young just got women. Yeah, they got rid of the old moniker and there is no new moniker. No, and they also changed the age requirements. For example, if you are going to turn 12 in that year, in January, you can start attending. So there are 11-year-olds that would be considered um, for beehives, whatever they're not or called now. Right, same same on the deacon side. You can get the uh, priesthood yep. now when you're 11, as long as you're turning 12 within the year. Yeah, that's yeah, a so, big difference, big for, difference. So the big takeaway here, though, is Janet is 14 or 15. So let's just that's just why I wanted to take that, that small digression. That is, it did till I met Ted Morris. Ted was a senior and a top football man. I just couldn't believe it when he started dating me, a lowly sophomore. Ooh. Ted wasn't a member of the church, but uh -oh. that didn't seem to bother me too much. Somehow I had the idea I could convert him when the time came. Mm -hmm. He seemed so glamorous compared with the boys at Mutual. The golden green ball was coming up, and oh, I did so want Ted to take me. I remember how thrilled I was when he took me. I was so proud of the decorations that I'd helped prepare. Okay, so think about this. Janet is dating a non-member. How do you think this is going to work out, Rebecca? Well, I don't know. She said it doesn't seem to bother her, which is surprising to me. And I think we should point out that a golden green ball is a church function. This is not at school. This is something at her church that she has invited him to, and she's very proud of how they put it together. But it's at the church. Right. Uh, I have reviewed a lot of movies. I haven't seen a lot of them end very well if she's dating a non-member. So that could be a signal as to what we're going to get here. This is going to be a treacherous relationship. The floor show, everything seemed so perfect. Mm -hmm. But Ted was bored with it all. Uh-oh. Before I realized what was happening, Ted was escorting me from the dance for a rendezvous with some of his friends at a little spot out of town. So first you skip mutual, then you have petty larceny, then smoking cigarettes, dating non-members. Now it's seedy clubs out of town. This is a slippery slope, Rebecca. A little spot out of town. Famous last words. This does not look good. Oh, no. The evil jazz music is here front and center. And swing dancing. How scandalous. I hope nobody starts twerking. That's just, uh, you know, what, what could happen next? <laughs> Getting in the mood here. Isn't this a neat place? Just everybody's here. I don't see anyone here I know. <laughs> None of the high school crowd are here, Audrey. Take a look in that corner. Say, aren't those the fellows who got their names in the paper? What I mean is, they don't have a very good reputation. You show sure reputation, conscious. Yeah, why don't you just relax? Hey, wait. What are you going to have, baby? The usual. How about you two? I'm not very hungry, thanks. Get her! Who said anything about eating? They make hamburgers. If that's what she wants, that's what she'll get. Hey, waiter. Okay, kids, what do you have? I'll take a, a lemonade, thank you. Come on, Janet, don't be chicken. Make her the same as ours, Harry. She'll drink it all right. No, really. All I want is a lemonade. Bring an extra beer, Harry. If she won't take it, Bill will. Okay, so... Ted is aiding and abetting a minor drinking alcohol. And they're serving alcohol. It's hard to get a beer even if you're in your 40s in Utah. I mean, the, the liquor laws must be much more relaxed. And I would like to make the point about the reputation. In every church video dealing with dating and teens, that is a major theme. They judge each other. They judge their reputation. And they base all their decisions on that. It's a reoccurring theme throughout all Mormon videos about dating or relationships. Yeah. And this waiter, um, he should be arrested. He's literally serving uh, alcohol to minors. Ted's, it, he's still in high school. Is he 18? I mean, you can't drink in Utah when you're 18. I mean, this whole thing, come on. Hey, let's go. Let's go. Sure. Hi, Ted. Come on, dance. Oh, come on. She won't mind. Be right back, Jen. Hey, Ted's courting two women at once. Are you sure he's not a Mormon? Yeah, I was going to say he is in Utah. This is the Mormon way. <laughs> uh, he's, he's, it's rubbed off on him. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> folks think if they knew. The golden green ball was so lovely and Ted wasn't even impressed. I wasn't very impressed with him by this time, even if he was a senior and a football hero. 
anyone who preferred this place to our golden green ball is lagging somewhere. Yeah, he's lacking somewhere. I guess he's uh, a little short in the manhood department, if you know what I mean. So much for being a football yeah. hero. So much for being a football hero. I felt so cheap and embarrassed. I just had to get out of there. What was it Sister Howe said on the Dear to My Heart evening? Girl, don't put yourself in a spot where you may have to compromise. If you do find yourself in such a position, get out of it quickly. Where are you going, Jan? I'm going home, Dad. Why? I suppose I should tell you I had a headache or something, but I'm not going to. I don't like this place. I'm miserable here, and I want to go home. Look, we just got here. You don't have to take me. I'll phone someone to come and get me. Relax. I'll take you. Where are you going? I'll be right back. I'm taking Janet. What are you going home for? Because I like it there. Give her what a square. Okay, so this is the last step, by the way, spoiler alert, this is the last we see of Ted. So um, what are your thoughts on Ted and this entire first boyfriend? This is kind of like the Goldilocks approach here. This is the first boyfriend. <laughs> you know, I keep trying to see the whole situation from Ted's point of view. He's just a normal guy. He asked a girl out. They went to a dance where not too much was going on. He said, hey, I know a funner place where some of my friends are. Let's go over there. And the next thing he knows, she's jumping up from the table and she's demanding to be taken home and says, well, if you don't know why, I won't tell you. So from his perspective, he's probably pretty confused. And I would think it might be their last date. So Yeah, it turns out to be the last date. And I think all of that is very, very solid, except for one thing. He was pressuring her to drink alcohol. That is a major red flag. I don't care what society you're from. So Ted, he's a, a Ted, he's a dud, right? He must be a dud, although he is a football hero. So I kept a diary, but indelibly written on my memory are certain special nights. It was at an interstate basketball game that I first met Kent. Kent is one heck of a guy. He's very attractive and he plays basketball, my preferred sport. Another rooster in the hen house. <laughs> She's working her way through the sports. Yeah. <laughs> I knew he was Lloyd Eldridge's cousin. So naturally I made it a point to chat with Lloyd. I left all over the place for you. I want to treat a dance. You must have skipped out early. Well, we did leave a little early, Lloyd. You see, I was with Chad. Oh, hi, Cuz. Wow, he Kent is one heck of a handsome guy, huh? Look at look at his hair. That's what yeah. struck me at first. My goodness. He's got the complete package. This I I'm really looking forward to Kent. He's a serious upgrade from Ted. Oh, hi, Kent. Great game. Well, yeah, yes, it was. Uh, oh, this is Janet. Uh, or uh, Janet, this is Kent Wright. Hello. Hi. Where are you two going? I thought if you were going someplace for hamburger, I'd like to come along. Oh, well, Lloyd and I aren't together. Oh, what I mean is, we were just talking. Well, that's better. Still, how about you and I going someplace, okay? Oh, I'd love to, only put up Lloyd with... Oh, Lloyd won't mind. I know he'll need to go and study. What kind of study's done? Just a deep, <laughs> burrowing bookworm, this boy. <laughs> See you around sometime, fella. And thanks for the intro. Bye, Lloyd. Well, how do you like that? That's the story of my life summed up right there with Lloyd, let me tell you. <laughs> You can identify, huh? <laughs> yeah. But first thoughts about Kent. First thoughts. Uh, first impressions. Well, interesting. I think they were both a little manipulative in this scene. I mean, Janet is interested. She knows he's there with a relative. And so she makes a point to talk to the relative, hoping to meet Kent. So she kind of maneuvered her way into that introduction. And here comes Kent. In you know, sees her instantly, likes her, tries to see if they're going somewhere together, and then whisks her off and just sort of dismisses his cousin. So they, at, they worked it to be together. <laughs> it looks like we're at church, though, too, right? That's why I wondered if it was a stake basketball game, because back in the day, those were as well attended as what we saw in that other clip. They were huge. Well, I like what I'm seeing. Kent is a member of the church. He's very handsome. When you compare him to Lloyd, there's no contest. So um, let's just see what happens. And he skis? He's a dreamboat. Yeah, he plays basketball. He skis. He goes to church. What's not to like? Ken was 19 and the smoothest fellow I'd ever met. Wait a minute. How old was Janet again? Well, uh, I don't know how much longer this was after, but she can't be more than like 16 or 17, I, I don't, possibly. I don't think very much time has gone past. Boy, that's, that's, I, I just got to assume that she's still a Miami. That's, that's my assumption here. There wasn't anything he couldn't do well. Anything? Does she anything? I'm liking where that I'm liking where this is going. This is good. Skiing, dancing, swimming, just name it and he could do it. Yeah, but does he hold the holy Melchizedek priesthood? That's important. I think he does, I think. Well, let's hope so. I was so crazy about him and I didn't have to be talked into going steady. And I do mean steady. As time passed, we were together almost every single night. Mother was beginning to worry. We've been keeping such late hours. 
Janet, you're not going to miss church again tonight. Oh, Mom, it's so stuffy in church. Besides, Kent wants to go up in the canyon. His uncle lives up there. Okay, so Rebecca, church, wait a minute, church at night? I'm not familiar with that. What? I what? know, you are too young. See, again, this will date me because... Be prior to the gas crisis in the late 70s, you would attend a Sunday school type meeting, kids and adults in the morning on Sunday. Then you would go home, keep your Sunday clothes on, and then you would return for sacrament meeting in the evening. Now, it was always a question. You could tell the very faithful Mormons were the ones that were a little more relaxed because some people might go on a picnic or go to the lake and not return for church at night. So that was a big distinguishing factor. You had to go in the morning and at night. Of course, that ended once it became impossible to afford gas to drive back and forth and then the consolidated three hour block. But when I was younger, that's exactly what you did. Stayed in your Sunday school clothes all day and went back at night. Right. The consolidated block started in 1980. So this is prior yep. to that. But it's been four weeks since you were to sacrament meeting. We'll probably go next time. Mom. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Mom. Hello, Kent. Now, Janet, I want you in early tonight. Okay, Mom. We'll try not to be too late. Try? Try? Not good. For goodness sakes, Janet, let me give you a lift. You need a try. Hi, Sister Wellman. Are you sure it won't be out of your Oh, way? not at all. Come on around and get it. Oh, thank you. I know, Janet, you've had a perfectly wonderful excuse, but I'm just selfish enough to want you in my class. You're the best bait I've got. What do you mean, bait? When you're working toward your silver gleaner, all the rest follow suit. When you're not, for some reason, interest lags. So, uh, Rebecca, silver gleaner, um, are you familiar with what she's talking about here? Yeah, I have heard of that from my aunts who were about this age in the 50s. And, you know, throughout Young Women, like there you're showing a picture of the Young Women's Medallion. That's what I was playing for when I was a young woman in the mid 70s and 80s. Um, but prior to that, there were other kinds of awards and Silver Gleaner was one of them. You would do different tasks and things to pass things off, read scriptures, learn to paint your nails, keep your hair nice, things <sighs> like that, that would prepare you for your role as a wife and mother. And then you would get jewelry. That sounds really amazing. I'm so I, I can't I can't deny it. that sounds fantastic. Um, and I'm not at all being sarcastic. Um, yeah, but you had a different medallions and pins and things like that. Uh, in the in 1949, you had a beehive charm bracelet. In uh, the 1972, you got a bee pin or a charm. And in this is the time of this film here, Rebecca. 1950 to 1955. Uh, excuse me, 1950 to 1959. You got a silver gleaner pin, which is a sterling silver G. Could be used as a guard for the golden gleaner pen. I actually found a picture of this here. They call it a silver gleaner because you're gleaning like, um, you know, when you go out into the farm and you, you know, the field is white all ready to harvest. It existed in the Young Women's Program here. It was a precursor to the Laurel class. So that's what the silver gleaner, that's what she's working towards getting. That's wonderful. And I think now they have something called the silver cleaner because we're so often asked to go to the church building and tidy up. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> that's good. Well, it isn't that I don't enjoy your class. I really do, but, well, it's just that... I know. You're in love. When do you plan to be married? Get, get married? She's still a sophomore. She's like 14. You got to get there. If you're in love, it has to happen right away, so something else doesn't. I mean, maybe she's a couple months shy of her 16th birthday. Does that make it better? <laughs> I... In some circles, it might. <sighs> oh, we haven't talked about marriage. We just like being together. What I mean is, of course you do. That's a perfectly natural thing. But it can also be very dangerous. Dangerous? You're two young, healthy people in love. What starts out to be a wonderful thing can very easily get out of control and wreck your lives. So let me get this to see if I've got this right. You're two hot, super hot, fertile Mormons who may not be able to hold out for the honeymoon night? I think that's implied. Absolutely. <laughs> Play it smart, darling. Taking the mutual into church. Try and spend as much time as possible with other people. Then be sure that those intervals when you two are alone are brief. That's the only safe way, I know. It's either that or join a convent, you know. <laughs> I guess I better be going in. It's been nice seeing you again, Janet. Thanks for the ride. You know, I sure wonder where Kent stands with the church. We don't really know yet, do we? No, we don't. It's kind of alluded to perhaps that he's on the fringe of being active, but we don't know exactly. Yeah, we don't know yet. Again, it's getting late. We'd better go. It isn't even 12 o'clock yet. But it was after 1 o'clock before we got home last night. 
I mean it, Kent. You've got to take me home. Okay. On one condition. That you pack a lunch, and after I get off work tomorrow, we drive up the canyon. But you promised to take me to Mutual. In the summertime? Oh, wait till basketball starts. Oh, can't you never take me to church? Well, you keep saying after you're we're going... married, then we'll go to church. You promised, Kent. We've at least 20 miles to drive before we get home. Okay, have it your own way. Well, uh, that answers the question, doesn't it? Yep, things are coming to a head right there. She wants to go to church, and he'd rather take it a little easier. So, And it's not going to change after marriage. <laughs> no. It just so happened that the lesson was on temple marriage. What a coincidence. What a shock. I mean, every lesson was on temple marriage. It <laughs> sure is. Now, girls, I'd like to pose this question. Yeah, she wants to pose this question. Um, uh, did Joseph Smith have actual carnal knowledge with every single one of his 33 wives? No, you know, actually, no, sorry, that's not the question. I don't think she's, that could be a good question, though. Yeah, but, that would never have come up. Never. Oh, sorry. Okay. Ron, uh, you know, sorry. What are the three most important dates in your life? Any date's important in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I'll put it another way for Peggy's benefit. What are the three most important days in your life? Okay, days in your life. What is she talking about here? I think she's talking about pivotal events that we all go through here in mortality. Right. And the idea here also is the uh, young women, they don't determine for themselves what their most important life events are. No, the church already knows what's the most important for them and will reinforce that through lessons like this. Your entire life plan is already mapped out for you. You don't need to wonder what is important. Prophets here and uh, prophets, seers and revelators, they've already done that for you. Well, and thank goodness. It's so confusing to think for yourself. It, yeah, it is. It is. Rosalie? the day a girl gets married good now it's a foregone conclusion that everyone gets married if you don't you will literally miss out on one of the most important days of your life now that's one of them who can point out the others Catherine I suppose the day one is born and the day one dies yeah I love the penmanship here by the way um so those are your three most important days right there huh birth marriage yeah, and death I I love this scene because that really sums it up right there. What it was like to be a young woman in the, for me, 70s and early 80s. You're born, you're married, you die. Calvin, <laughs> we can't do much about numbers one and three, but we certainly can have a great deal to say about our marriage. I love that penmanship. Girls, never settle for anything less than temple marriage. If a man doesn't love you enough to want you forever, it's a pretty good indication that he's not the right man for you. And don't be so unwise as to think marriage will change him. Of course, he'll make promises. But if he doesn't give up his bad habits for you now, there's less than a 10% chance that he'll give them up for you after he's got you. Remember, girls, Temple marriage is the most important thing that will happen to you in your entire life. And don't spend the rest of your life regretting that such a marriage might have been yours. You know what? Men are scum. They're not going to change. <laughs> Never. There's less than a 10% chance that they ever would. I wonder where she got those statistics. <laughs> yeah, I do wonder. If a man doesn't want to marry you in the temple, then the, by implication, he must have bad habits. The implication is that there are no good men outside of the church, period. No, and that's true. And, and that actually is not an exaggeration. They would say things like that. If they do not love you enough to take you there, they don't really love you. That was something that they definitely got across in the young women lessons in my era. They need to love you and take you to the temple. Otherwise, it's not real or authentic. And, and the reason that temple marriage is so important is because if you're temple marriage, then you live the word of wisdom, you pay tithing, you go to church, you do everything you're supposed to do, then you're making promises. No one wants to be a covenant breaker. It's in, literally the entire gospel is, is prepped for that temple marriage because that is going to place you onto the covenant path and make sure that you remember church for life. That's exactly right. And even though the phrase covenant path did not exist for another how many decades, four or five decades after that, that's what they were doing. Yeah, and just one last thought. There's there's a really uh, a problem with this line of thinking here is is that over 50% of church members now in the modern day, 50% of church members are single. Uh, it's something like know, almost 60% never get married. And, and, and remember, not all of those marriages are even in the temple to begin with. So three quarters of the members of the current church are not married in the temple. And that's a big contrast from 1956. But that creates a lot of problems when you say your entire life contract is built around this one event. And if three quarters of your members are, aren't, are, are, are participating in that, that's a big problem. 
Yeah, it is. Again, the narrative of the church doesn't match what reality is. And there's a lot of heartbreak for people trying to fit into that narrative when it, when they don't or can't and thinking that they're not you know, a good person or doing the right thing until they do. So it, yeah, this really shines a light on it. <laughs> Jazz music. Not tonight, Ken. I just don't feel like it. Why is Janet not feeling it, do you think, Rebecca? Well, you know, she just heard that propaganda. I'm sorry, lesson. Oh, And right. now she's realizing that their relationship doesn't sound like what the teacher was describing. And so now she's just disgruntled and looking at Ken through new eyes. He may not be the partner that she thought he was. Especially since there's less than a 10% chance that he's going to shape up. Okay. What's the matter with you, Janet? Lately, you've become nothing but a worry ward. I'm not worried. Yes, you are. You, you worry if we don't go to church, worry when we go to shows on Sunday. You used to be fun. Oh, I've had lots of fun with you, Ken, but never when I was doing those things that I knew I should. You got a busy little conscience, haven't you? Can't help it. That's the way I am. Oh, better watch out. You'll be sprouting wings. Oh, look, Annie, quit torturing yourself. and wrinkle that pretty brow. Don't think I want to marry an old lady, do you? Ken, I notice you've been talking a lot about marriage lately, but... You haven't said when or where. Tomorrow, if I can talk you into it. Ken, yeah, don't be silly. You be all packed when I get home from work tomorrow and we'll take off for Las Vegas. Las Vegas? That was the big sin. I'm telling you, and you know this, there are other church videos where people run off to Vegas, often get killed right on their way home after they've been married. So this was the big sin. It wasn't that you wouldn't get married. It was that you would get, they couldn't even fathom that, but it was that you would get married in the wrong place. Right. This is, yeah, as you said, this is yet another church movie where we're given two choices, a holy, sacred, refined temple ceiling, which fulfills every single one of your most important life goals, or a vulgar, disgusting Las Vegas Sin City marriage. Those are your, those yep. are your options. That's it. Only two. Yeah. Um, now, the church, by the way, has announced a uh, temple in Las Vegas, so maybe it's not as bad to marry, get married in Las Vegas now, although um, <laughs> it's, still, it's still under construction. I believe that they broke ground a couple of months ago. Ken, I don't want that kind of marriage. Well, I trust a woman to want the frills. <laughs> this is so sexist. <laughs> oh. Yeah, women, they are kind of particular about their marriages. Boy, that's the darn those women. Yeah, how dare they? Yeah. I was thinking about a temple marriage. Do we have to? You mean you don't want to get married <laughs> in the temple? It might be okay 10 years from now. That's the only way I'll ever get married, Ken. You know, of course, I can't get a recommend. Why not? Well, I haven't been to church in months. I never paid any tithing. Besides, if you ask me, I think it's all a lot of hooey. Okay, so what are we hearing from Kent now? Well, now you kind of see who Kent is. He's just a normal, nice guy. He was probably raised in the church or, or maybe, but he's he's just kind of down to earth regular. He hasn't really paid tithing. He hasn't really been active. He understands that he probably can't go to the temple. Maybe in the future, you know, he, he's not completely opposed to it, but it's certainly nothing that he's set, you know, his every goal on right here. We're finding out about Kent. He's too easygoing. Yeah, and of course, this is Kent's, this is the only chance for uh, Kent to explain why, why don't you go to church? Why don't you pay your tithing? Why don't you do all these things? This is his chance, but we're only left with a lot of hooey. So there's no one in a church movie that I've ever reviewed who's struggling with his or her testimony or activity level that ever gives a real reason for their inactivity. The implication, again, the implication is, well, I, I could get a temple recommend, you know, if I just paid a little tithing, if I just was worked a little harder, if I wasn't a lazy learner. I could, I could be part of the gospel plan, but no, we just get, it's a lot of hooey. Kent, you don't mean that. Why is it so important? If you don't know, there isn't much use in my trying to tell you. Oh, Janet, let's not quarrel about trifles. I'm in love with you. I want to marry you. Let's take off for Vegas. Kent, I meant it when I said I'd never marry outside the temple. It's getting late now, Kent. You better go. When you change your mind... Let me know. This is one of the last scenes that we get with Kent. So what message are the filmmakers sending us by uh, Janet rejecting Kent at this point in time? Well, my observation is that I don't think Janet really even cares about Kent or thinks of him as a person. She wants to check those boxes. And in her mind, she goes down through those boxes. And as soon as he falls short, he's out the door. The following Sunday night, I went to Stake Fireside. I secretly hoped that Ken might be there. I hadn't heard from him all week. But I felt sure that he'd eventually call me. I was ready to leave when... 
Hi, Dennis. Well, hi, Dag. This uh, shrinking violet is Tim Morgan. You don't know it, but he's been trailing you for the past 48 hours. Now, it doesn't take Janet long to find new suitors, does it? Well, like her mother said, boys have been in love with her since she was three <laughs> years old. But uh, this is our new third boyfriend. This is like Old Box and the Three Bears. So, um, you know, it's one is too cold, one is uh, too hot. And this one, though, we're, you know, not to spoil it, but uh, Tim Morgan here is our third boyfriend. He does not hold a candle to Kent as far as physically, at least for me. I, I, uh, Kent oh, is totally agree. You can't do better than Kent, but he's no. been trailing her for 48 hours. So what? he also has some really good stalking skills, apparently. Yikes. I, uh, yikes. That is yikes. Trailing me? Well, what do you mean? Well, I told him you were going steady. I saw you at the dance Friday night. And before I could get an introduction, why you disappeared. And I came to your Sunday school this morning, but I didn't see you. Well, I teach a junior Sunday school class. I know. What did you want to see me about? Oh, I thought that if I was going to marry you, we should get acquainted. Marry me? Now, wait just a minute. Oh, he's not kidding, Dad. He really means it. Of course I do. My mission president said that he'd give his returning elders just six months to get married. Well, I've been home five months, three weeks, and four days. And 11 hours. Now, if you two are honeymooners, well, excuse me, I'll be running along. Oh, boy. Oh, temporary. Oh, love. Where is thy sea? Boing. <laughs> that clown. Now, let's see. Where were we? Oh, yes. Would you rather be married in Salt Lake or in St. George? Uh, Tim doesn't beat around the bush, does he? Well, it's that evil doctrine that was taught by mission presidents back in the day. I hope not now, where they literally did give you a time frame, and that worked. I personally know many people that it did not end well when they followed that advice and married someone that they were not compatible with and hardly knew. But the pressure's on. He's only got a few hours left to get married. <laughs> I mean, we haven't even gone out on a date yet. No. Nope. This, there's no. no romance here. There is nothing no. here. And, and just also remember, if you think back to Kent, he was 19. He never talked about a mission. He was not a returned missionary. Mm -hmm. The first two suitors, they were not returned missionaries. This one is. And that's awfully important. Now, listen, I don't ever lean towards St. George. Then we can go up to Zion's for a two-day honeymoon. You'll pardon me if I seem a little old-fashioned about these things. But, you know, I've never been proposed to in public before. Well, I've never proposed to anyone in public before either. And you probably won't believe this, but I've never proposed to anyone before. I didn't intend to do it this way, and I know I've made a complete fool of myself, but please, can't I take you home? Well, okay. I got to know Tim pretty well in that week that followed. On Monday, there was the ward outing in the canyon. Tuesday, mutual with the dance that followed. Then he took me to the driving for the double feature. Friday, his M&M team played softball. And Saturday, he took me down to meet his folks. How do you feel about uh, Tim's dating location choices? You know, I have to point out, though, this is what the church was like when I was growing up. There was something almost every night that was a kind of an activity. And that's why I still say it was just a different day. And that is completely missing now. Completely missing. There's nothing like that at all. But yeah, it's uh, one, I think it must be a cheap date because he didn't have to pay for anything. He can take <laughs> her to the war dance. He can take her to the softball game. No, but that's what you do. He, You know, they are dating in the LDS construct. They are checking each other's boxes. And I don't mean that metaphorically. And so, of course, you're dating in, in public and everything. Everybody's really excited that these two worthy young people have found each other. And it's all going to play out in front of everyone in the ward as good examples to the younger kids and testimony affirming situation to the older people. It's it's very positive. Yeah. So on, on Monday, we're at the ward outing. On Tuesday, the mutual and the dance. Uh, church softball on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, we're meeting folks on Saturday. We're going to church on Sunday. There's no jazz music. There's no CD clubs. There's no out-of-town mm -hmm. bars. There's no beer. There's no skipping church meetings. No late nights in the car. Tim is on the straight and narrow path. Tim, it's, it's just beautiful. I'm kind of proud of it. Great grandpa brother when he came over from England as a convert. Yeah, Tim's even got a good Mormon pedigree. He sure does. And he's got a hot car, too. You know, his stock is rising. <laughs> but you've got company. No, what you see is just part of the Morgans. Mom had 12 of us. I have a couple married sisters who are out to break even her record. So Tim is from good Mormon pioneer stock. Family of 12 kids. Sisters are active. He's heavily involved with the church. What a bore. Boring. Hi, Dougie. 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 Hi, Dougie.
Um, okay, so th this is literally Mormon utopia, Rebecca. You're just surrounded by dozens of white and delightsome children in multi-generational families. The only thing that would make this any better if we were pursuing the law of cel celestial marriage at the same time. I think maybe they are. And if you notice, we didn't know anything about her other suitors' families. They were no. alone. They never had any connection to anybody. And, and now we see again this amazing family that's just going to embrace Janet. And you're right. It is a utopia. This is it. This is what heaven is supposed to look like right here. Just rows and rows of kids. All of which are white. Hi, Mom. Hi, Lethe Tachi, the legendary Mormon actress. She strikes again. She's in 14 Mormon movies, uh, one of the most prolific actresses of all time. Mom, this is Janet. Janet, we're certainly glad to meet you. My, we've heard so much about you. Hi, sis. Hello, Kim. Janet, this is Vivian and her chickadees. Hello, Hello Janet. Why, well, you're even prettier than Tim said. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I'd like you to meet Earl Laughlin. Vivian's husband. Uh, Vivian's husband. I'm going to go out on a limb here to say that uh, Earl here, he's uh, white. Is that a safe bet? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you would expect nothing else. Are you kidding? <laughs> you can't swing a dead cat by the tail without nailing a light-skinned primary kid here. This is, I guess, is what heaven's supposed to look like. All right, come on. We'll go right over and find you. Everybody's active. Everybody goes to church. Hi, Earl. Hi, Tim. How are you? Hi. Janet. This is Earl Laughlin, Vivian's husband. How do you, How do, you do? do? I'm happy to meet you. Very nice to know you. Say, you're just about in time, boy. Oh, no, Earl. Oh, no. <laughs> I just have to say he's not going to work today. He's All our right. Special day today. Come on, Janet. Let's go meet Grandma. All right. No, we'll see you in a little while. Yes, that's fine. How's the ice cream? Oh. Is it nearly finished? Hi, Grandma. Oh, Tim. Grandma, I want you to meet Janet Howard. Oh, How do you do? Come a little closer or I can have a better look at you. What is that? Oh, sorry, wrong movie. Okay, my bad. <laughs> so this is the girl you're going to marry, Tim. Grandma. Well, why did you round the bush? Tim's 26. Grandfather was only 20 when he married me. I'd say he better put a rope around a pretty little thing like this before she gets away. <laughs> okay, okay, so good one, Grandma. There's nothing quite as funny about joking about a non-consensual marriage to a 15-year-old high school sophomore, and we learned that Tim is 26 years old. Yeah, it, it, it was a different day. That's all I can say. It was, must have been a different day. Ah, okay. Uh, you know, Tim, I'm, I'm not as keen on Tim as I was before. I'm sorry. I just... <laughs> Tim hadn't talked much on the way home. I kept thinking about how embarrassed he'd looked when Grandma had said, so this is the girl you're going to marry. He didn't seem at all like the glib young man I'd met at Fireside just a week ago. The next night, he spoke at our ward sacrament meeting. Of course he did. It had been a long time <laughs> since I'd heard any Vera testimony like he did. Tim is the most boring man who ever lived. <laughs> I think so, too, but unfortunately, he checks all the boxes. Where's Kent? I miss Kent. I, where is Kent? Kent! Come on, buddy. Get it together. It was still early when we got out, yet he took me straight home. Of course. I guess I won't be seeing you for a while, Janet. What? Uh -huh. I'm leaving you for Fort Ord in the morning. Fort Ord? You don't mean you joined the army. They sent me such a nice invitation. But, but you haven't said a thing about it. I know. I guess I should have, but... Well, I didn't want to admit even to myself that there are so few days left. And then, too, I thought you might think I was having my last fling. I even told the folks not to mention it to you. Janet, is it okay if I write to you? Of course. And another thing. See, you don't take yourself up solid the weekends I get through basic. Okay, he's joining the army? And he didn't want to tell her? I mean, I think I and, and he also told her his entire family to lie to her. So Janet is completely being manipulated the entire time. And they're starting out right. They're not going to talk to each other during their marriage or share important information or make decisions together. I That's mean, how it's supposed to be. I mean, I guess some people might find it a little bit odd that her boyfriend um, is joining the army, moving away, not telling her and, and having other people deceive her. But remember, Tim, he comes from a long line of Mormons who are very comfortable hiding things. So I guess that just comes naturally to him. Yeah, sounds just about right. In those weeks that followed, I found the most important man in my life was the mailman. The dutiful Mormon girl waiting for heroic army um, uh, uh, fiancé, I don't know, fiancé or boyfriend. I, that just brings a tear to my eye. She's just staying home, pining away for him. And cleaning house. She's wearing a kerchief, so she's cleaning house. They're both fulfilling their 1956 roles.
Jim's letters were masterpieces of wit and humor, but never the slightest inkling in them that he was particularly interested in me. But as far as that went, I told myself, was I interested in him? After all, there was Kent. And even though I hadn't seen him in almost two months, he was still very much in my mind. Right, there's still a chance with Kent? Let's hope. <laughs> uh, yeah, hope springs eternal. Then one afternoon, Kent phoned. Hello? Yes? Why, yes, Kent, how are you? Yes, I am a little surprised. Oh, of course you can. 8.30? Okay, fine, Kent. Goodbye. Hello? This is Janet Howard speaking. Western Union? Just a minute, please. Savory. Okay, I'm ready. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Mom, Mom, come here quick. Goodness, Janet, what's the matter? Oh, Mom, I just received a wire from Tim. They're sending him to Fort Riley, Kansas, and he just has one hour here between trains. Oh, it's after two already. Mom, would you please get the car keys while I go get dressed? I forgot to pause it. One second. Um, we're going to talk over this little oh, train car. Oh, after two already. Mom, would you please get the car keys while I go get dressed? Okay, so Fort Ord is in California, and Fort Riley is in Texas. Which, that confirms to me, if we're in the middle of that, that the setting here is in Utah. Now, it is important here. I'm a, I'm a former veteran myself. Soldiers, when they finish basic training, it is extremely customary for them to get several days or even weeks of uh, vacation time between assignments. But giving Tim just one hour in the Utah, that heightens the dramatic tension of the next scene. Exactly. Train stations are very romantic and very dramatic. Ah, handsome fella. We'll have an hour to ourselves, I thought. But little did I know. <laughs> After 500 embraces, Tim finally got to me. I got a handshake. The family started bombarding him with questions. How was the food? Were the officers nice to him? Did he think he'd like Fort Riley? Finally, he announced to his family that he was going to take me around the corner for a mob. So he greets all the kids with a hug. He even kisses the mom. He greets Janet with a handshake? Yep, up and above board, right there. They're not even engaged <sighs> yet. That's not how you do it, dude. Come on. <laughs> Look, when you come back from a military deployment and you haven't <laughs> been around any women ever. Uh-oh, okay? where is this story going? Where is this story going? <laughs> I can tell you, when I came back from military deployments with my wife, it's like a second honeymoon. It's not going to yeah. be a handshake here, buddy. Yeah. Trust me. You'd think a man with a range would have plenty of time for the most important thing he ever does in his life, wouldn't you? What's that? Well... The first time I saw you, I, I asked you to marry me, remember? I could have kicked myself a thousand times since then. Well, thank you. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. It's just that, well, a guy just doesn't get flip about a thing as sacred as marriage. The minute I said it, I realized I meant it. And that's why I haven't said another word about it since. Well, now, with just a few minutes before the train leaves, I'm asking you again. Only this time, I've never been more serious in my life. I want to tell We couldn't get married until after I get out of the Army, maybe, but... Tim, I've got to tell you something. Before I started going with you, I was going steady with another fellow. We had a quarrel, and I haven't gone with him since, but... I have a date with him tonight. Tonight? Hey, Uncle Sam! Come on, Tim, don't hurry! Okay, Butch, tell her just a minute. Well, after you see him, you'll know. Give me your new address. Whichever way it turns out, Tim, I'll let you know. So many decisions that she needs to make. I'm sorry. They don't, either of them have a passionate bone in their body when it comes to their relationship. No. And get ready <laughs> for the- I less. 
Yeah, and get ready for the most breathless prayer that you have ever heard. Dear Heavenly Father, I've got to make the most important decision in my life, and I need thy help. Somewhere, I've picked up the idea that a girl can only fall in love once. I felt for a long time now that, that I was in love with Kent. I felt so sure that he'd finally come to see things my way. Maybe he has. Maybe that's what he's coming to tell me tonight. But even if he does, I'm not so sure now that he's the man I want to marry. I found so much that's fine in Tim. His testimony. The way he treats his family, and, and when he looks at me, I feel so, well, like, like wonderful music was playing all over. Only, I don't know if it's excitement, or if it's really love. I know how important marriage is, and I know the one I choose must be the right one. Help me, Heavenly Father, to know which one it is. What should Janet do, Rebecca? It is a good question. My personal opinion, she's very attracted to Kent. He is more her style. He has a sense of humor. They get along very well. However, uh, he does not check those boxes. Uh, Tim, he checks all the boxes, and I think that's all she's looking for. I don't think she's really even looking at the relationship or the person. She's looking at the external elements that will make him fit into what she has been told her entire life that she needs to choose. Hi, Janet. Hi. Oh, for me? They're lovely. Thank you so much, Kent. Why don't you sit down while I get a vase? beautiful it's nice to see you again Kent. i guess you think it's funny my coming back like this but i've been thinking it over and maybe you're right what i mean is if a temple marriage is what you want it's okay with me too what i really mean is it doesn't make any difference to me one way or another well what do you say i'm very conflicted here he's willing to go to the temple i mean give him a shot that's what i say me too. I suppose I should feel highly complimented. Well... No, Kent. The only trouble is, I'm I'm not sure I still feel the same about you. It's that Morgan guy, the returned missionary, isn't it? Why, <laughs> Sister Wellman, come in. Hello, Hello Janet. You've met Kent, of course. Yes, how are you, Kent? Fine. Well, I've got to go. I'll see you around sometime, Janet. Goodbye, Kent. Easy come, easy go. He's not a return missionary. He never had a chance. Nope. Janet, you look as though you'd seen a ghost. Sister Wellman, if, if a man came to you and said he was willing to be married in the temple because it didn't make any difference to him one way or another... What would you think? I think he'd be doing it because he'd know that was the only way he'd ever get you. So it looks like Kent's motives were not pure enough. It's not enough to just go through the motions. You actually have to have pure intent as well. Yeah, and what is more romantic than saying, all right, I know it's really important to you. I'm not quite there yet, but I know it's important to you, so I will do it. Yeah, that's not good enough at no. all. No, nope, it's Kent's not. Kent's terrible. Right. <laughs> Morgan. Competitor out of the running. When next I see you, put your arms around me. And if I feel that I belong, then I'm willing to talk long-term contract. Janet. 
Yeah. Man, oh, man. What's the matter? Hey, you hurt yourself, buddy? Hey, you feel all right? Me? Yeah, I feel great. Haven't you got that dress off yet? I wear it such a short time, I thought I ought to enjoy it. Wallow around in it to your heart's content, but you'll press it, young lady. Oh, Aunt Rose, did I ever tell you how grateful I am for taking you with us to Fort Riley to see Tim last summer? That's when I found out how wonderful Tim really is. Okay, so she was a my maid. Now that was last summer. So she is maybe 15, 16 years old here, okay? I mean, she's really young. Don't thank me. Thank your folks. They didn't want an old maid on their hands. Old maid? Well, once you hit 17, it's all downhill from there. <laughs> I guess so. Thanks, Alan. Why do you want to see you on the office there? You're the curtain if you might on that. Did you hear that, Jan? You can't see me. I'm in my wedding dress. That's bad luck. It's terrible luck. What is he doing? No. And who has a better oh. right? Listen to those angels. Oh, isn't she beautiful? Just like an angel. And that's for having her. Yeah, it is beautiful, isn't it? Dress? I'm not looking at her dress. I'm looking at the girl I'm going to marry. The girl who's going to be my wife. Forever. Okay, can you read us that quote there, uh, Rebecca? It says, how glorious and near to the angels is youth that is clean. This youth has joy unspeakable here and eternal happiness hereafter from the first presidency in 1942. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, how near to the angels. That's from that quote, by the way. That's where we get the quote, the title of the movie, How Near to the Angels. Now, I did some research on this quote here, and uh, I've got a little bit of a surprise here um, for you that's regarding to this quote. So let me pull this up for you. So this quote that we got this movie from is from the April 1942 General Conference from Heber J. Grant. And it was a message to the youth. And it says, to the youth of the church, we repeat all the foregoing advice. But above all, above all, we plead with you to live clean. For the unclean life leads only to suffering, misery, and woe physically and spiritually. It is a path to destruction. How glorious and near to the angels is youth that is clean. This youth has joy unspeakable here and eternal happiness hereafter. Sexual purity is youth's most precious possession. It is the foundation of all righteousness. Better dead, clean, than alive, unclean. Are you serious? That's that quote where... from my favorite video and the title from my favorite video growing up was sandwiched in between that. That's this is like the a happiness letter. They took out that quote and they used it against all of us. I am shocked. Yes, that's um, not exactly the, the ending of that quote. Tom. There's a reason that they left it off, even of the 1956 movie. Yeah. So um, some overall thoughts here on Janet. How, how do you feel about Janet, her choices, the, the choices that she made, how, how she approached things? What are your overall thoughts on Janet? You know, I think she did exactly what she had been brought up to do. And like I said, this really was one of my favorite videos when I was younger. I would check things out of the Meeting House Library. That's why I've seen everything. I'm such a weirdo. Um, but I loved this video because it really did encapsulate what we were supposed to do and the goal that we were going for. And, and it was beautiful the way, you know, from my perspective then, how it was supposed to be. Of course, now I understand reality. <laughs> but it, it definitely shows you that that is the path. And, and even though there are some choices that might seem like they're okay, Kent, not okay. You've really got to go for that upper echelon there. Even if it's not exactly a match, he checks those boxes. I keep saying that, but that is really what it's all about. I mean, if you could know the youth activities, the young women activities that we did back in the day, um, trying on wedding dresses and taking pictures when we were 14, writing letters to our future husbands, um, you know, to put in a hope chest, it was all geared toward that. So Janet did exactly what she was supposed to do. And if you saw her mother and her aunt crying, they had successfully raised a daughter who was married in the way that she should be. So they also shared her success. Everybody was in it together. 
Yeah, there's a certain Goldilocks and the Three Bears approach to this movie because we have three boyfriends. Ted, not a Mormon, and he just disappears. He's not even worth mentioning again. Kent, one heck of a dreamboat, but he's a Jack Mormon. And finally, we get Tim, super boring cookie cutter, but hey, he's a returned missionary who bears a strong testimony, and that's how, that's really all that you need. I mean, think about the first boyfriend, Ted. He never brought up marriage, period. Kent, he did talk about it a lot, but again, Las Vegas. He, and when he said temple marriage, he wasn't sincere enough. But Tim, he brought marriage up right away. So Tim, he checks all of the boxes. He is the guy who we should all be going for, I guess. The film's overall message here, um, it's kind of, I, I have a couple of takeaways that I, I got from the film. Number one, one small step off the straight and narrow path, like skipping mutual, listening to jazz, can lead to heartache and jeopardize your entire life plan. Yeah, I Number think so, because at the very beginning, she said, when I think how close I came right. to not having this eternal outcome. And you're right. What did she do? Jazz music, went to a, a dance, those kinds of things. Yeah, so close. So Num close. Number two, hanging out with the wrong friends is nothing but trouble. Okay, Babs and um, uh, Betty, was it Betty and Babs? Anyway, I think Jen, so, Babs and Betty, yeah. Yeah, her first two friends, they were um, up to no good, and you should pick only the best of friends. Number three, uh, marriage in the temple is the single most important life event for a young woman. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the head. That's exactly the message. You got it. No man can compare to a return missionary who bears a strong testimony. That just decimates anybody else, regardless of what other qualities that they bring to the table. Yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely 100% true. Yeah, and a couple, a couple, three more takeaways from this movie. Even if a less active member who you're really into says that he will start paying tithing, start going to church, is willing to marry you in the temple, do not trust him. He's not to be trusted. No, there's a 10% chance he'll never follow through or less than a 10% chance that he will follow through on all of those. So there's no forgiveness. There's no repentance. It has to be the perfect package right away. You can't settle for anything less. Yeah, and a young woman's personal feelings about her marital suitor, they're of almost no importance. It's only her lover's uh, Mormon bona fides that really matter. <laughs> that is absolutely correct. And one final takeaway is Mormon utopia is achieved by going to mutual, attending fireside, playing in the church sports league, getting married in the temple, and of course, women who had 12 children bearing tons of kids. Bottom line, one's entire life should be built around church activity. Yep, that's exactly true. And then when your life doesn't turn out like that, or you're not able to do that, then how do you feel inside? And that's where all the problems begin. Uh, Rebecca, thanks so much for joining me to uh, review this film. Yeah, it was really fun. And again, I just, I'd like all your viewers to know that this really did capture what it was like to be a young woman, 50s, 60s, like me, 70s, 80s. I think it started to change after that. But, but during that era, this really captures it. Yeah, so everyone, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and join us next time for another episode of the Mormon Movie Reviews, where LDS movie lovers belong, where we will review Joseph Smith, a prophet of the restoration. So long.